And now again, as we would read and study God's word in the sermon, let us pray to God. <clears throat> Our gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that you will give us the hearing of faith, that you will fill us with thy spirit, that you will illuminate us, Father, both the preacher and the hearers, that your name may be glorified in the body of Christ as we are built up in the most holy faith. And as we would go forth from here, renewed in the covenant of grace, and going out to serve by true fasting, as Isaiah 58 speaks of, breaking yokes, freeing people from sin, serving people in your name, Father, loving you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, loving our neighbor as ourselves, selves that love you, because you first loved us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, tonight we're going to continue to study 1 John, 1 John. So if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to 1 John 2. 1 John 2, and tonight we're simply going to read verses 12 through 14, 12 through 14 of First John, First Epistle of John, chapter 2. This is the word of God. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God lasts forever. <clears throat> I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you have known the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. Thus far, the reading of God's word. Now, in 1 John 2, so far, by way of review, we have, we have encountered tests tests of our faith, you might say, tests of where we're at in our spiritual walk with God in Christ. In verses 3 through 6, we saw a test of obedience. We saw a test of love in verses 7 through 11. And now we have a third test, and we might call this a test of knowledge a test of knowledge, but not just information. I know that we live in the age of information and we have more information that we can possibly use. This is experiential knowledge. Uh, the knowledge about which Hosea wrote in chapter four, verse six, God's people perish because of lack of knowledge. This is a test of our experiential knowledge of God in Christ. And now commentators differ here as to who is being addressed. Some commentators, even John Calvin, thinks that there's two groups that are being addressed because John uses the phrase little children other times in his epistle. But other commentators, and I must say that I know it's, it's a very challenging thing to disagree with John Calvin, but I'm going to disagree here. I think he's talking about three groups because of the very strict parallelism, parallelism of the three groups. Little children, young men, 
and fathers. Hmm? So I think there's three groups. And what do they represent? Well, they don't represent ages in the church. <laughs> they represent levels of knowledge, levels of maturity in the born-again Christian, in Christians. So that there's little children, they're the ones that are new to the faith. They've been born again, but they're very young in the faith. Then there's the young men. Now this, of course, includes men and women. Don't worry about that. Uh, it's generic, and so we don't worry about that. And the, the, young, the young men are those that are growing, and now they're, they're in that median range. Everybody's at a different place huh, in their spiritual life. And the older men, the old men, the fathers, are the very experienced in the faith. Very experienced. All right, so let's look at these three groups and test our knowledge, our experiential knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are some here that are undoubtedly just new Christians, perhaps. New Christians. And what does, the, what does the word say? What does John write under the influence of the Holy Spirit to these dear children? He writes, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. Your sins have been forgiven. That's the basic thing that we learn when we become a Christian. That's the thing we're filled with wonder about, huh? that we're, we hang on to. Jesus has forgiven my sins, huh? and he's made me right with God. That's so basic, that's so basic. For the forgiveness of sins in Jesus' blood. And I trust tonight that you've all know in your hearts that you have been forgiven and that you stand as righteous in the eyes of God. See, we're dealing here with the doctrine of justification. Justification. Now, you've studied that in catechism, so I'll just repeat it quickly. That's a declaration by God Declaration of God received by faith. It doesn't happen before you have faith. It happens at the moment of faith that you, a declaration by God that you hear in your heart that you are forgiven of all your sins by the once for all shed blood of Christ and that you have been imputed, you have been reckoned as righteous even though you're not righteous. At all? Not at all yet. You're just beginning your Christian life. You have many sins yet. But you've been declared righteous. In other words, that great exchange has taken place. And you wonder about that. You have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's beautiful. Jesus was declared by, by the Father huh, as guilty, guilty. And therefore, he was punished as guilty, even though he wasn't guilty of anything. He took our guilt upon himself. And in turn, we Christians who have faith, the gift of God, not of ourselves, that no man should glory, we are, have his righteousness accounted to our account, just like we have a bank account, and somebody puts into that account three million dollars. Would that that would happen to me. <laughs> but anyway, and of course, to be righteous in the eyes of God is far more rich than three million dollars. It's more rich than any amount of gold or silver or any quantity of any gems to be accounted righteous before God. And then, 
And then another thing happened, because all this happens in, in, you might say, the courtroom, the courtroom of God. It's a legal, it's a legal declaration. It's forensic. It's forensic, huh? You're declared righteous, innocent, not guilty. And as the catechism, the Heidelberg Catechism, I think, says, just as if you never sinned. Huh? Isn't that the way the catechism goes? I think so. Just as if I never sinned, which is utterly amazing. Now, God still sees our sin, of course. He sees our sin, but not to hold it against us. Never again. But he sees our sin so that he disciplines us. He chastises us. He grows us up. He forgives our sin daily as we confess it. But we've, we've received that once for all forgiveness and justification by declaration of God. And that declaration holds. It doesn't depend on anything else. That de declaration holds for eternity. Once for all declared righteous. Now that is a wonderful, wonderful doctrine. Now, and it says that in so many words in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, where it says that, you know, many kinds of sinners are in the church. Idolaters, sexually immoral, adulterers, Male prostitutes, homosexual offenders, thieves, greedy, drunkards, slanders, swindlers. And that is what some of you were. Hmm? That's what you were. But you're not anymore. But you were washed. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus, just like our text says. Hmm? Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That's what justification is. Now, are you all, as new, new Christians and the other ones too, of course, are you benefiting from that knowledge? From that knowledge that you've been accounted righteous. You, all your sins, past, present, and future, are forgiven. And you stand right with God. He loves you. When he looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Christ covering you like a garment. And that spurs us on in sanctification. That spurs us on to become holy. Now, he writes to these dear children again. And in verse 13, the last part, he says, I write to you, dear children, because you have known the Father. Now that speaks of, probably, adoption. The doctrine of adoption. Now let's, let's follow this courtroom scene a little further. The judge pounds his gavel, God, and declares, you're, you're, in, the, you're in the seat there, you're as guilty as, as can be, but he declares you innocent, not guilty. And you have, a, you have a lawyer that's sitting next to you, and his name is Jesus Christ. And then the judge comes down off his pedestal, and he embraces you, and he says, I accept you as my son. I accept you as my son. Now that, that I, I submit to you, is what happens. To the Christian. We're adopted. We're adopted because we're born again. Because we're children, we're adopted. We're not children because we're adopted, but we're adopted because we're children of God. That's right. And now we have all the privileges of the children of God. All the privileges of children of God. And he treats you as loved children. He loves you perfectly from that day forward, from the day he came off his 
pedestal, came down to you, embraced you, says, I love you, you are my child. That's what new Christians know. Do you each know that? Do you know that? And is it, is, affecting, is it affecting your life? That's, that's a foundation of faith. The forgiveness of sins, justification, adoption. It's the most beautiful thing, beautiful thing. Now, now there's another group, another group. He speaks and we're going to go to the young men now. These are growing Christians. And he says to the young men, I write to you because you have overcome the evil one. You have overcome the evil one. Why is that so important to the person that's not new as a Christian, but now you're struggling? The glow of having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, being forgiven, adopted into God's family, calling God your father, is maybe worn off just a little bit. It shouldn't, but it sometimes does. And you're struggling against sin now. You notice that. Before you were Christian, you didn't struggle against sin. You just let sin into your life. But now you realize that you're in warfare against sin. Daily, you have sins that be easily beset you. You have sins that you still like. And of course, we wouldn't, we wouldn't commit a sin unless we liked it. You know that. We, we like sin, and that's why we do it. But you're in warfare. You realize you shouldn't be doing this anymore. You're, the, you're a growing Christian. You're mature in a way But in another way, you're not mature. You're struggling. You're struggling. You're in that medium range. And you need knowledge. You need knowledge that you have overcome the evil one. Wow. And that will spur you on in your struggle against sin. It's a It's a fact. It's been achieved. And when was it achieved? When Jesus overcame the evil one. You know, when Jesus was on the cross, the devil had his hour. Jesus said that now is is your hour. He struggled. He struggled on the cross. He never sinned. He struggled with the pains of hell. It was a an amazingly, amazingly intense struggle on the cross. But then Jesus, before he died, said these words, It is finished. To Telestai. It is finished. And at that moment, I submit to you, the devil knew that he was defeated. He was defeated. In other words, Jesus was saying, Father, I have accomplished what you sent me to do. I have accomplished the redemption of all you have given me. The redemption is done. I didn't just win the possibility of redemption. No, I actually redeemed your children, your elect. It is finished. It's done. The devil knew he was defeated. And now now we're just having the mop-up operation. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. Now where does that come out in Scripture? It comes out in places like Romans 8. Hmm? Romans 8. What does it say in Romans 8? Well, it says this. In verse 31 i got so many markers in here, I can't keep them straight. What then shall we say in response to this? We are called, justified, glorified. What shall we say in response? If God is for us, who can be against us? To tell us that it is finished. 
Who can be against us now? The devil is defeated. You have overcome the devil, the evil one. The devil is, cannot do anything against us now. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge? You know, you remember the vision of Zechariah. The devil had brought a charge against Zechariah. The devil loves to bring charges against us. He loves to cause doubt in our lives. You're guilty. You're not really a Christian. Otherwise, you wouldn't have done that. You wouldn't have said that. You wouldn't have thought that. You wouldn't have felt that. The devil loves to do that. No. You have overcome the evil one. Nobody, not even the devil, can bring any charges against you now. All those charges were dropped. You're justified. You're adopted. It's done. You're my child. You're in the arms of the Lord. Nothing can hurt you. Nothing can hurt your soul. We Christians really need to have that knowledge, don't we? We have overcome the evil one. Therefore, we're to account ourselves as having defeated sin. It says that in Romans 6, doesn't it? Romans 6, verse 11, in the same way, because we share in the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ, in the same way you count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. We've defeated the evil one in Christ. So we're, that's our self-image now. Not any of these worldly self-images, but we're to account ourselves as dead to sin. It's been defeated. The devil's been defeated. We're alive to God in Jesus Christ now. That's terribly important in our struggling daily with sin, our warfare against the devil. We've got to know he's defeated. He's defeated. All right, what else does he say? What else does he say in, to, the, to these medium Christians who are growing in Christ, but, but they stumble sometimes, you know? He says, I write to you in verse 14, I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God lives in you. We have to know that, don't we? We have to know that we are strong not because of anything in us, but because of Jesus. He is in us. We are in him. We live out of him now. We have all his strength. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Philippians 4, you know the text. You are strong. Why do you act weak? <coughs> Why are you succumbing to temptation? You are strong. Fight the devil through prayer and the word. You know how it is, right? You know how it is. I'm speaking the truth about all of our lives. We're in warfare. We know, we need to know that we are strong. Just like the Lord taught Joshua when he took over the mantle from Moses. He said, the angel, the Lord Jesus, pre-incarnate appearance of him, said, be strong, Joshua. Be courageous. What basis did he say that for? Because God had called Joshua. He was going to equip him. He's called you. He's given you the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, in your daily struggle with sin. Know this. You have overcome the devil. You are strong. The Word of God lives in you. You're convicted by the Word of God. The Word of God shapes our lives. You look at everything now through the lens, as John Calvin said, through the lens, through the spectacle of scriptures, 
of Scripture. That is your worldview now. Scripture plans your whole life. It's the pattern of Scripture in Christ, the living Word. The Word of God lives in you. It's like Jesus took, told some people that had historical faith, perhaps. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah, but they didn't have true faith. He said, if you are truly my disciples, you will continue in my Word. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. John 8, verse 32 think 33 it's very important it's so important struggling Christians struggling Christians you've overcome the evil one because Christ did on the cross you're strong you may not know it but you have to become self-consciously strong in Christ <clears throat> weak to yourself strong in Christ and the word of God lives in you. All right, that's the, that's the growing Christian. Growing Christian, young men, including women, in that middle phase of their Christian life. And it's very real. Are you passing the test of that kind of knowledge? All right. Now, there's a third group that John, in the Spirit, Christ, really, speaks to, and he calls them fathers. These are the older, very experienced Christians who are now, should be quite settled in the faith once delivered to the saints. They've known him who is from the beginning. Children, who is he that was from the beginning? Jesus, right? Jesus was from the beginning. It says that in John chapter 1, and it says that in 1 John chapter 1. He's from the beginning. You've had a long relationship with Jesus Christ. You're strong in the faith. You're settled. You're now helpful to others. You, you can disciple others and help them with their struggles because you no, you've been there. And you've, you're more than conquerors. You have lots of knowledge of the scripture. That's the test of the older Christians here tonight. Now again, I say not older just in the church, because there could be someone here tonight. There could be someone here in the morning who's been in the church a long time but is not a Christian. It could be. It could be. One time in Canada, I was called to the bedside of an elder in the church. And when I got to his bedtime, he was dying. He was dying. And he said, Pastor, I'm, I feel totally insecure. He had no assurance of his salvation. He was an elder. He didn't know whether he was saved or not. He, he had done his best. I've, I've always done my best. Well, you know that line. That doesn't cut it. That doesn't cut it. He wasn't sure if he was saved. And so, you know, I found myself bringing him the gospel the gospel of Jesus Christ and him crucified for sinners. And he died by God's grace in a state of assurance of salvation. I'll never forget that. Yes, there can be an older person. There can be an elder. We just don't know. God knows the state of your heart. And we're speaking to your heart tonight about your spiritual knowledge your experience as a Christian. Yes, you have the doctrines of the faith. The older Christian should have those pretty well in order. All the way from creation to providence to redemption to judgment to all these other doctrines, the ordo salutis, 
should have that all pretty clear in your mind by now. Settled, settled. You've come through many trials and temptations, and you now you should be experiencing lots of comfort. And we need that as older Christians. We need comfort, don't we? We're experiencing the comfort of that wonderful question and answer of the Heidelberg Catechism. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own. Older Christians should know that for a certainty. That I belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who has, and you know the rest of the answer. I can't remember it. Okay. Well, you know that. And you know that. And so you can be very helpful to struggling Christians. We have older Christians here tonight. Yes, we do. I'm one of them. And I take great comfort from this knowledge. I know that him who is from the beginning, the living word of God, the second person of the Trinity, and therefore... God, the Father, and the Son have made their home in me through the Holy Spirit. And I am well. It is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. I, I know where I'm going. And I know why I'm going there. Nothing in my hands I bring. Nothing. Only to the cross I cling. I know that. I know that. I remember so much, so well, never forget it, when my mother died, when my mother died in a hospital in Fort Myers, Florida. She had rheumatoid arthritis, and the doctor had put steel ball joints in her knees in the hopes that that would help her walk, but it didn't. It didn't help her at all. In fact, infections grew in both of those knees, and she had to she had to have those both legs amputated above the knee to stop the travel of the infection. And after the first amputation, she was well. She was okay. But after the second amputation, she wasn't well physically at all. It was too much. It's just too much. And all four of us children stood around her bedside in that Fort Myers hospital. And we prayed together, and we said the 23rd Psalm. And she smiled at all of us, said goodbye to my father and to each of us children. She knew exactly where she was going and exactly why the grace of God in Jesus Christ. And it was wonderful. It was wonderful. Now you say, dying, that's not so wonderful. But a dying Christian is a wonderful thing to behold. A wonderful thing to behold. Are you all here ready to die? That's a question, isn't it? Are you ready to die? Do you know that you've been regenerated? You've been forgiven? You've been adopted by the God? He's your father now. He loves you for eternity. He has good in store every day for you. Everything is going to work for good for you. You have overcome the evil one. The word of God lives in you. You are strong. You've known him who is from the beginning. <clears throat> yes. There you have it. There you have it, three levels of maturity of Christians. And, and children, you should be listening too because you're being trained as covenant children, children set apart to God. That's what you are, children. Set apart to God. You've been baptized as a sign and seal to show that. You're in the covenant of grace and you're learning the faith. And we're looking, as you grow up, we're looking for the fruits of faith. 
We're looking for, for you to start praying very sincerely to God as your Father in Jesus Christ. We're looking for that desire for his word. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for you to love people in the Lord Jesus Christ and not to be selfish. We're looking for evidences that you're learning to deny yourself already. You're learning to deny yourself and, and to suffer well, to suffer well, to take up your cross. And you're learning to follow Jesus. That's what you're learning to do. So children, you're not off the hook here. <laughs> you should be listening as well because you're learning all of this. Well, these are three foundations of faith. Sins forgiven. Knowing the Father and the Son. As Jesus prayed that in John 17, this is eternal life that they may know. The Father, God, and him who thou didst send. And third, the victory over sin and Satan. Well, what should we do with this knowledge? Did you pass the test, wherever stage that you're? Did, did you pass the test? I hope so in Christ. I hope you pass the test. What should you do with this knowledge? Well, you should say with the Apostle Paul. That's what you should say. You should say not that I have already attained all this or have already been made perfect, but what do I do now? I press on. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, that's all behind, and straining toward what is ahead, straining toward sanctification and holiness in heaven, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward, in Christ Jesus. That's what we do now. We keep growing. As R.C. Sproul said once very correctly, the only Christian is the growing Christian. Hmm? That's very true. That's very true. Not lukewarm, not satisfied, not satisfied with your life, Satisfied with Jesus, completely satisfied with Jesus, but not satisfied with how you're living. You're struggling with sin and you're growing in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Well, let's take these tests to heart hmm? and live them out. They will help you. This knowledge will help you tremendously in your daily activities in your family, at your job, with your neighbors, in the bank. We are witnesses now. We are witnesses. Do people see that in us? Do people see that knowledge in us, that, that confidence, that sweetness, that quietness of spirit that comes from having this knowledge? Amen. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we know that we're not perfect. We're learning. But Father, we just pray that you will give us these parts of experiential knowledge. Forgiveness of our sins, adoption, into the family of God. Overcoming the evil one because Jesus overcame the evil one. And knowing that he will be vanished to the lake of fire one day. He will be utterly, utterly exposed to be a fraud. And Lord, having known him who is from the beginning and being strong, being in the Word, the Word living in us by the Holy Spirit. Father, help us to pass these tests. 
Help us to live for your glory. Teach us not to sin against thee, but teach us holiness, Father. Because that is our goal. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's respond by singing.